All right, all right. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of class today, this week we're going to start building a blacksmith shop. We're going to start looking at the process of making buildings. Now, the process of making buildings and exterior geometry for a real-time rendering environment on the geometric side is not too drastically different from how we do in, the, in a, uh, how we do this in the television and feature film world. But there are some minor differences and there's some workflow things that we need to discuss to really ensure that we're walking through this project in a timely, timely manner. So let's just take a look at some of these ideas. So you're going to be building a blacksmith shop, okay? This is going to be a project that we're going to be living with over the next number of weeks. So we need to spend some time and energy really coming up with a good design that we're happy with and will serve both the conclusion of this project and hopefully our portfolio, okay? Because if you're really looking to get a career out there in the game world, being able to create buildings and exterior geometry is kind of one of our stock and trade kind of moments, right? It's something that we do often and a lot of, okay? Now, we're pretty fortunate that we're going to be advancing into a level of detail here with buildings that's getting more and more high quality, okay? I love the generation of rendering technologies that we have because finally we can start adding some compelling ge geometric information on our models and have them rendered in a seemingly real-time fashion, okay? So this is yay, thumbs up. Things are getting better for us in the real-time world. We're no longer being faced with these kind of boring flat surfaces. We can actually put some relief and some, ge some geo in there to describe some compelling information. Well, let's talk about the workflow. Let's talk for a second specifically Let's talk specifically about how we're going to begin. So this is my little blacksmith shop, but this isn't where I began, okay? I began at a much more basic form. Talk to me about the first step in creating a custom blacksmith shop. Where's that going to come from? Maybe a box, but before we even open up Moto, what's the first thing that we're going to do? Yes! Yes, Melissa gets a gold star for the day. Reference, it all begins with the reference collection, okay? Even for something as simple or seemingly as simple as a blacksmith shop, we want to get some reference. And this is the reference image that I found online. I like this and I was like, cool, I want to build something similar to this. So in every sense, this was my goal. This is my goal for my little project here. It's a good chunk of reference. Now for this project, you can do whatever the hell you want to do when it comes to the style of the blacksmith shop. I've chosen to kind of go for a kind of old English kind of style blacksmith shop, mostly because there's just a ton of reference out there for objects like this, right? It's really, really easy to get a good photographic reference library for this style. However, if this is not your thing, if this is not your style, and you want to do something totally different, I say go for it, man. I have no problem with that. Just be consistent and make sure that you're finding good reference images that are, that's going to support your decision-making process, okay? I had a student uh, a couple years ago now, he did a wonderful, and I mean wonderful, blacksmith shop that was like a, a Japanese architecture style. Just really top-notch. So pick a style that you're into, I, 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 it doesn't really make a difference to me, and then just run with it, okay? Use reference. Open up the Googs, okay? Open up the Google. Just type in blacksmith shop. You're going to find 10,000 reference images quickly that will help support your decision-making process. You don't start without reference, okay? Now, the reference, in many cases, is a good starting point, okay? But it's never a good ending point. So if you look carefully here at the blacksmith shop image that I found online, this is a good starting point for me, right? Now, is there much that I can use in here inside of Modo? Yeah, not really. No, why not, Sam? Yeah, they're all angled. Eat. These are pictures. These are pictures with perspective infused inside of them, right? Photographs are always going to be perspective images, right? And all the lines, all the vectors in that image are going to bend towards the vantage point in the scene. They're never going to be perfectly orthographic blueprints that we see in other areas, right? So this is a good start, okay? but they're, don't, they're almost never going to produce backdrop items for us. Almost never, okay? Unless you're actually getting, like, you know, construction schematics from, I don't know, you know, like a 1600-era blacksmith shop, and the chances of you finding construction schematics or something built in the Renaissance, yeah, probably zero. <laughs> Unless it's been recreated recently, right? So this, these are good starting points, and now we're going to have to start using the thing between our ears, right? Our brain to figure out the spatial relationships between all these different pieces. And herein kind of lies the challenge in this process, okay? 
is figuring out how all these things are going to work together. Let me show you a really great trick that I use when I'm, whenever I'm conceptualizing something in Moto or any 3D app for that matter. A lot of folks forget that you can do this. Let's check it out. It's really kind of neat. Uh, now, over in Moto, if you just check it out real fast, we have this Clips tab. On some of y'all's machines, it's going to say Images. It's the exact same thing, OK? If we open it up, this is where all of our uh, all of the images that we import into Moto are going to reside. Now, I've kind of chopped mine up in Photoshop here, just putting each one of those perspectives into its own image. Uh, and if you double click on them, and this is what I like, right? It brings it open, open into its own floating palette. And I want to keep this right on my screen as I'm modeling and beginning to flush all this stuff out. It's a great little trick. That way, you don't have to shrink the Moto interface down. I see you guys doing this all the time, and I don't know how you guys do it. You guys have brains that are much more awesome than I do. Uh, and this is not a criticism, it's just something that I notice. You guys make the screen smaller, and then you'll put this like over here, or in a background image, or in a web browser image, uh, and then you're left with just this small window here to work with, and that's fine, it really is. But I'm all about making things as big as I possibly can make it. Maybe it's because my eyes are getting old. Okay, it makes it a little bit easier for me to model. Okay, so have this in here. Have a floating palette or a keep the reference image in your scene at some point or at some place so that we can get through the initial stage of conceptualizing the total volume that this thing is going to dominate quickly. Okay, because in the game world, time is money and we have to go through the entire modeling phase of this as quickly as we can. You may only get a day to model a building. That's like 8 to 12 hours depending on which studio you're working at. Think about it. 8 to 12 hours to model the building in its entirety, high res rated rock and roll. That's not much time. You may only get half a day to do the UV maps and then another, another day just to do the textures. Okay. Everything in a real time game engine has to be created by hand. There's no procedural generation of all of this stuff. Actually, I lied. There is procedural generation. Uh, but it's this, that technology is super, super inaccessible, right? It's procedural generation is only really uh, available for the like, games like Grand Theft Auto V, right? Where they're, where they're modeling an entire region of Southern California. You know, th th there's a reason Grand Theft Auto V costs two hundred eighty-six million dollars, right? Because they use some big-time toys to get those to get that, those images. Okay, let's talk a little bit about process. Whenever I'm working on a new design, the first thing that I do is I try to as quickly as I can, and I really do mean as quickly as I can, define the shape. What are all these planes going to look like, right? How are they going to intersect? What's the size of the building in relationship to other big details? So from here, I'm allowed and able to just kind of prototype and iterate as fast as I can to get a good sense of the spatial understandings of this entire building. Here's, I always call it my layout mesh. I practice what I preach. You know, I have a couple of stages of modeling in this project file that kind of should help us, right? Uh, and I'm just, this is not good geometry, right? This is not, in any sense, what's going to end up in the, final, uh, in the final game itself. It's just the thumbnail sketch in 3D. It's supposed to be raw. It's supposed to be pretty basic. Of course, there's going to be a lot of polygonal errors inside the mesh, but that's not the point. The point of this stage is just to kind of get through and understand how all these pieces are going to work together spatially. Because seeing it in a picture is one thing, but once we start throwing down geometry, it's going to change, right? Uh, you know, what is it? Uh, oh, I've forgotten his name. The, uh, the famous Chinese general Sun Tzu or Sun Tse, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, right? He's famous for saying that no, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy, right? This is the kind of same idea, right? The battle plan is a reference, and that's just going to kind of get shuffled out the door once we start actually building it, right? It's going to be our foundation, but things are going to change, and we want it to change. If we, don't, if we don't tweak our model and change the design as we're building it in the layout stage, you're not looking at the model, OK? And you're just kind of robotically going through it. Look at your geometry. See how all these planes and these transitions between the different surfaces are occurring and make some decisions, OK? Keep it as low resolution as you can. If you look carefully at my mesh here, I'm not dealing with 10,000 polygons. I think I'm not even dealing with 100 polygons, OK? Why? Why am I keeping it pretty basic? 
Why do you think? Thoughts. Yeah. Well, this is just the layout stage. We're not gonna, this is not a representation of the model that's eventually gonna get UV. But why do I wanna keep it pretty basic and extraordinarily light at the layout stage? Because we are gonna have to change something, right? We don't wanna lock our brains and our modeling pipeline into something that's uh, pretty high quality, right? The moment we start up our geometry early on is the moment that we become almost kind of like you know, emotionally attached to that geometry, right? You guys have done this before, you've modeled something, yeah, and then you kind of, like an hour into it, you're like, okay, this is it, I can't make a change to this because I just committed an hour to a doorknob, okay? <laughs> I, I can't make a change to my doorknob, this is it, right? Well, we want to we wanna paint with a pretty broad brush stroke early on so that we're not locked into that design, okay? Kind of, you know, freeze your mind from this entire uh, from the structure of your geometry. That time will come. We will have to make some pretty, uh, some pretty big decisions and start locking it down, but work loosely for as long as you can. Okay? Here's a great example of how things just kind of go haywire. If you look at my roof here, man, that is not good modeling in here, right? There's some pretty big errors in there, but that's okay. This is just the layout stage. I'm just trying to figure out how all this stuff is going to work together. In addition, I mean, I got some, you know, intersecting geometry as these cubes in here are punching out to the top. That's okay. Of course, naturally, I'm going to fix this in the future. But for right now, I'm just trying to figure out how all of this is going to work together and get a good understanding of what I need to build, okay? Because the reference images are only going to give you about 20% mm, of the information that you need to build the darn thing. The rest of that info is going to come from the first pass itself, okay? Keep it basic, keep it rough, okay? And allow yourself to explore, okay? Don't swing at the first pitch. Change some things. Start asking yourselves questions of what would this look like if I change the pitch of the roof? Or if I put the door here versus over there? Or maybe you start doing a mashup. I love mashup ideas where you take something, you know, a design element from, uh, from one building and then put it on another, right? That's a lot of fun and you can create something very compelling and unique, okay? Okay, so where do we go from here, right? I spent some time flushing it out. I'm pretty pleased with the overall volume and the general shape that I've crafted. And now it's time to actually begin making a pretty darn good model, okay? So I advance, that's the layout stage, and then I advance into what I lovingly refer to as the rough model stage, okay? And I want to turn the visibility of the wireframes of my layout, of my layout model on just so we can compare and contrast the two different shapes. Because the layout model told me one, you know, kind of allowed me to explore one series of, of questions. But when it comes time to actually finishing the model itself, and that's going to be representative of the final product, things once again are going to change and shift as I, as I start to more accurately and cleanly model the shape. Okay? I think here's a great this roof line had to get pushed out quite significantly to accommodate some, ad some additional detail that I created on the inside, different from the layout. Yeah, the size of the roof down here was changed. Some posts were changed, the locations. Yeah, so, you know, the layout stage is just the beginning. It looks like I botched the angle of the roof over here and the layout, if you compare it to the wireframes, that's okay, right? That's okay. The layout stage of our model is just the first thumbnail sketch. Good 3D modelers model in passes, right? You finish one stage, you go on to the next stage of detail. You finish that stage of detail, right? And then you up res it again, right? And you start adding more and more and more. And at each construction stage, you're left with a more complete result, OK? Some things in here that, you, that you're probably going to want to start to define pretty quickly and pretty early on at this stage of the model is what's going to be geometry and what detail are we going to start to define using textures, okay? If it's pretty big, like a beam geometry, if it's small detail that the gamer may or may not see, texture, okay? 
You have to start asking yourselves the question, how close is the gamer going to get to this object? Are they going to be hanging out on the roof? Or are they going to be at ground level the entire time? If they're going to be at ground level the entire time, do we want to put a tremendous amount of detail on a part of the model that they're never really going to interact with? No, absolutely not. Part of the part of the mesh. Okay. Another thing that you're going to start, you're going to want to start to establish as you go through this phase in the model is considering how the UV maps and how the textures are going to be applied into your scene itself. Okay. Now we're going to talk about this area in a little bit more detail here in a minute. Okay. But these beams, these wooden beams here. Notice how I've begun to model each one of these wooden beams. Okay. It's not all one piece. We want to separate it out so that when it comes time to UV map this, it's really easy. And the wood grain for those areas is already going to be done. Okay. You can very quickly establish how the texture is going to be placed at the UV mapping stage during the construction of the modeling stage. Okay. Making sense? Making sense? Okay, great. If you do your job, and if things are starting to, to work correctly, you should be able to get a pretty complete model that then you can include some more high resolution in, uh, information on. Okay. This is an older version. Uh, apparently, I didn't grab the most recent one. But you can start to see on this version of the model file, I'm going in and I'm creating each individual wood plank in there. This is good information and simple geometric information that we can and should include inside of our, inside of our 3D models. Not everything has to rely on, the te on a texture to describe its surface characteristics. In this gen consoles and especially in the, the details, right? It can't be a 2,000 plank you know, model, right? If you look at some of the wooden planks that I've created for my shape here, it's pretty basic. I mean, it's just a glorified cube. Here's one. Okay, Just a glorified cube, nothing too fancy about it. Simple edge chamfer, and that's it. Actually, I probably could go and get rid of that back one if I wanted to. Now that I look a little bit more closely at it. And then just a couple simple edge loops uh, inserted into the mesh to give me the option to customize each plank from the rest, right? Because we want them all to look generally different from each other. If I turn off the wireframes, we want each one to kind of live on its own to a certain degree. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. All right. Let's talk about some modeling tricks and techniques that will help you construct some of these shapes quickly, right? Because this layout stage is supposed to be kind of really raw and very basic and and extraordinarily simple. But how do we go from the layout stage into the rough stage? And how do we start creating a, a more complete shape there we go, on the rough that's representative of what the final product's going to be? Okay. Let's spend some time revisiting some important concepts, especially when it comes to the architectural world and how we create and define these buildings. Now, we have to be good practitioners here. The game art pipeline doesn't allow us to be just kind of, you know, loose with our technique. We still need to strive to create quad polygon meshes. That's the gold standard as it always will be. So we need to look at how we can uh, very quickly slice up a mesh to get what we're after. I'm going to focus on the back here a little bit. And then we're going to jump over here into the front. Okay. Let's look at this back shape. This one here. Boop. Okay. So if you look, this is a pretty humongous piece of our geometry, right? It's a main stage of our model. It's going to get a lot of information when we texture it. But we want to make sure <clears throat> that geometrically we're describing some really important areas. Specifically, you know, so I would say the windows are an area that we probably want to describe geometrically. If, if we unhide the rest of the mesh, there's a bunch of trim information in here that we're going to need to look at. Okay that we can very quickly add and should add uh, at the model stage. So let's just kind of talk about this for a second. I'm going to create a new mesh item. And let's do this. Let's go back into my rough model. I want to hide everything but this. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Just kind of getting a good understanding of how all this is going to work together. And I'm going to simply rebuild that shape. All right. 
So this is how I would approach this after the layout stage. Of course, it's all going to begin with a box. Everything, almost everything in our world begins with a box, right? Simple modeling, simple modeling. Let's make my box kind of the exact same size as its counterpart. Okay, there it is. And now we need to go through and start really looking at how we're going to model this, okay? We have to start asking ourselves some questions now. And I'm going to help you guys out to visualize what we're going for here, okay? Here's my rough model. If I unhide the rest of my scene, I'm going to appear at the ground. And this is actually really cool, by the way. I, I was going to mention this earlier, uh, but we'll get, or I was going to, I love this, right? Okay, so I have pretty much a completed mesh here. If you go into your game tools layout, check this out. They've given us just like the coolest thing on the face of the planet, right? I've mapped my 3D view here, okay? This is cool, right? Down here at the bottom, we have a game navigation button, and this is rad, okay? If you enable this, you're basically going to go into first-person controller mode, and then go in there and check it out. It's a really great way to very quickly kind of see what the gamer is going to see, right? And we can use this to, uh, to influence our decision-making process. So as I look in the windows of that second floor, that second story uh, uh, room, talk to me about what you're seeing and what the gamer is seeing. Not necessarily the floor, okay? But really, we're seeing the inside of that, of that room, right? So it already tells us that we have to model the outside and the inside pretty quickly, okay? Now, the, the inside doesn't necessarily need to be extraordinarily detailed, but at the very least, we need to have some walls in there, right? At the very least. Windows and walls, okay, so that's the idea. I hit the escape key, I get out of the game view mode, and I can continue working. Let's go back over to my model layout and start looking at how we're going to do this. All right, so here's my cube, which in every sense represents the totality of our, uh, of our second floor uh, you know, bedroom. Okay. Let's first focus on how we're going to create some windows. How are we going to create some windows? Let's also pretend that we want... Let's see, one, we want four windows in here, and we want them to be all the exact same size as windows naturally are, right? Most windows on a building or a house are going to be basically the same, right? Help them out, help them out, booleans, right? And I love Vince's hand signal. We want to basically, you know, punch a <laughs> hole in the wall, right? We just want to punch it right in there, right? I love that, okay? Yeah, a boolean is a good place to begin, okay? However, booleans are super dangerous, right? Yeah. You could loop slice it a bunch of times. And the loop slice is good in certain areas, right? The loop, we could certainly loop slice it horizontally, okay? Loop slicing going this way is probably a really good idea because then we can define the height of all of our windows pretty uniformly, right? The power of the loop slice. But the problem that we run into are all the vertical loops, right? We want to make sure that we're establishing the same width quickly, right? So Booleans are a good choice, but we just got to spend some time revisiting how we're going to use them, okay? It kind of gets shuffled in pretty quickly with great power comes great responsibility. There's some excellent, excellent tools inside of Moda, but if we're not careful, those tools are going to totally bite us in the ass and make our job much, much more difficult than it needs to be. Okay? So let me show you some really great modifiers to the Boolean workflow that almost ensures that we're going to get super accurate geometry without too much huss and fuss. I like Booleans. They're a really cool thing. However, we need to just kind of take a look at it a little bit. Okay? All right. Let's be good stewards of our scene here real fast and rename some of this. So this is going to be my, let's just call it bedroom. Bedroom. And I'm going to create a new mesh item. And let's just call this windows. All right. We'll zoom out. Du, 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 du. Oops. Here we go. 
All right, so now on my Windows Mesh item, let's simply draw the shape of our window with, again, a cube. And here it is. This is the back of our house. Let's figure out how big do I want my windows. Something like this, maybe? That's a big window. Yeah, maybe something right around in there. Okay, me likey. Okay, now, so that's my window, and I like the size of it, but we need some accuracy in here, right? We need some big time accuracy in here. Let's pretend that my art director has come in and says, Pat, I like what you're doing here. Uh, here's the concept art, or here's what I want to see on the model itself, right? Because even in the 3D modeling industry, there's almost always, always, always going to be a supervisor, even on the modeling side. There's almost always a modeling supervisor or a creative director that's going to be responsible for what you create, right? So maybe he, he, uh, this person, he or she comes in, they say, Pat, good job. I like your windows. Here's exactly what I need. I need to have a window over here. And I need to have, so let me, let me do that again. I need to have a window here, and I need to have a window here. But most importantly, they need to be uniformly distributed across the surface, right? So the distance between the outside edge there and there and there and there need to be the same. So I go, yes, sir or ma'am, I got it. I understand exactly what you want. Now it's my job to figure out how to make that, okay? So we just can't place them wherever we want. They need to be uniformly distributed. How are we going to do that? On what? Yeah, let's, let's take a look at it. I'm going to cut and paste that cutter geometry, that window, into the same mesh as my bedroom. OK, rock and roll. Things are starting to look pretty excellent. But how am I going to center this object in here? Hmm. Interesting puzzle, right? Liam's got it. Action center to selection, and then do what? I like where you're going with that mirror operation. That's a good idea. But we still need to find an important feature, an important area in this mesh. Let's figure out some midpoints, OK? Let's start, to, uh, start establishing the middle of the selected cube, both horizontally and vertically. That may help, OK? Okay, let's just loop slice this. A count of one uniform. Boom. Okay, there's the middle of that of that of uh, of that loop of polygons. And then going this way, I'm going to do the same thing. All right. And this second one is very interesting to me. I get a tremendous amount of info from that second loop. Okay, because now basically what I've done is I've basically gone in to find a quadrant over here, and then a second quadrant over here that are identical in width and in height. Okay. Now I have something to go on here. I have something to go on, OK? I can start making some decisions. Oops. I think for me, what I want on this guy is that I want it to be centered in each one of these quadrants, OK? Initially, that's a good starting point, OK? All right. All right, so let's do that. I'm going to grab those guys, and I want to center that cube instead of that quadrant. How do I do it? And I don't want like kind of close. I want dead center. Melissa. Oh, I like that. That's a good idea. That's a really great idea. But there's a more accurate way to do this in this particular situation. We're going to come back to that snap system here in a minute. So don't forget that because that's really cool. OK? I use this all the time. And it's a great, great uh, workflow modifier. It's kind of moto specific. And it absolutely requires the influence of the work plane. Check it out. If I select those two polygons, I can align the work plane to the selection. OK? Let's go ahead and do it. Boom. Now, the center of the work plane is in the center of the selection, selected polygons. Let me prove it to you. 
If we go back to that work plane uh, drop down menu, we have an option down here called draw axis, which is going to visualize the center of the work plane. Boop. There it is. Okay. And lo and behold, man, my eye is really good. <laughs> I got really lucky. It's almost like I do this for a living, right? Because <laughs> I placed that object almost perfectly. That's like a pat on the back for me. Good job, Pat. I'm awesome, right? However, let's pretend that my cube was not perfectly centered, right? Let's pretend that it's way off over here, and I want to center it, right? With the work plane aligned to those selected polygons, now check this out. I can use my center selected command over my basic tool section. Center selected, and then choose all, or any combination thereof. Uh, oftentimes, when you align your work plane to a custom bit of geometry, your understanding or the global understanding of XYZ changes. So it can get kind of funky. You know, look at this. The compass is radically different now. Okay? That's because of the work plane being realigned to the selection. So let's just do center selection all. And now I know beyond any reasonable doubt that that cube right there is perfectly centered in that quadrant. Okay? Beyond any reasonable doubt. Okay? Which I like that. I'm all about beyond any reasonable doubt. Okay? Now I have a point of comparison and the beginning of the next step in our sequence, because I need to have a window over here and another window over there. Liam, what was your next suggestion here? After that, mirroring it. Yeah, mirroring it's the next step here. Now there's a couple things in here that we can do, right? We can align the work plane to this entire thing, or we can align the work plane to maybe those two edges, which will in turn see where the axes go. That works, OK? Because now I can just take that cube, change my action center to origin, which is actually going to put your action center at the origin of the work plane, OK? And then run near along the x-axis in this particular situation. And there it is. I'm done. Okay. Now, another thing that you could do as an alternative, just let me go back in time for a second here, is use our snapping system. I'm going to reset the work plane, and I'll turn off draw axis. Okay. This is kind of fun, right? Uh, I'll turn off my action center as well. The mirror tool, when we use it, is going to use the location that we initially click in our three-dimensional scene to define the middle point of that, uh, of that mirror operation, right? Without any sort of action center enabled, it's really kind of us to, up to us to figure out where we want the center of the mirror tool to fire off. Okay? Now, left and right, I have complete control of this if I click on this, this big blue cube right there. Okay, which is exactly and precisely what I want. But I want some accuracy in here. I want to be able to snap that icon to maybe an existing vert. We don't necessarily have to use the work plane, because we already have geometry on that cube, that middle line in the center, to represent where we want the center of the mirror tool to fire off, to fire off from. Right? Now, to get this started, I'm just going to go back and time a couple steps. There we go. And I want to enable our snapping engine. The Moto snapping engine is pretty amazing. It allows us to work quickly, and it stops us from having to use the work plane for every single stage. It yields us a tremendous, and I mean a tremendous amount of accuracy quickly. Okay? The snapping tools in Moto are so good, it's probably one of the best reasons to jump into Moto, believe it or not. Not all the applications that are in our 3D, 3D universe have, has a snapping engine like this. Let's check out how it works. We have a global snap toggle, right? That's what this is. We can either hit the button here, or we hit the X key on our keyboard, which is going to enable and disable our snapping engine. Now, this is just a snap engine. It doesn't allow us to uh, set up all the snap properties. That comes right here. Hitting the F11 key or that button will pop open this thing. And it will now be able to control exactly what we're snapping to. And there's a lot of different options in here. Okay, some, some important ones for us. Of course, grid. I do a tremendous amount of vertex snapping. And Melissa was uh, uh, highlighting earlier, center of polygon, center of edge. 
These are awesome things for us to use, okay? They're really quite good. I think for, for this step, I want to turn off the grid snap and turn on vertex snapping and click off of the form to dismiss it. Let me zoom out ever so slightly. Now, when I fire off my mirror tool, check it out. See how the cursor, when it, the moment it goes over, the, gets kind of close to that vert, okay? Because I'm doing vertex snapping right here. I get a rollover highlight telling me that, hey, this is the location inside of our three-dimensional scene that the mirror tool is going to snap to. And it sure does. Okay. So our snap engine in this particular situation gives us a tremendous amount of info to get everything where we need it to be. Okay. I like that. Drop the tool and I'm on my way. And now I have those two windows exactly where I need them to be. All right. So those two, believe it or not, were the easy ones. Let's do these over here. Now, with some of these snap options enabled, we don't necessarily have to go in and start subdividing our mesh a little bit to infuse a physical center line. At times, adding geometry can be a real detriment to our modeling process. Really, what we need to define and zero in on pretty quickly here is the center of some edges, right? The center of that edge and that edge, or just the center of that polygon, right? Let's check this out. I want to make some copies of, of my geometry here. I don't want to draw a new window. I want to copy this window so all of my windows look identical to each other. All right, so I want to copy it, edit, copy, edit, paste, and I want to fire off the rotation tool just immediately and rotate it 90 degrees. Now, without the, the, uh, uh, our snapping options on, it's up to me to figure out where all this is going to go. Okay? However, Let's get a little bit more specific. Let's see if we can place this cube in the center of these poly oops, the center of these polygons without using the center selected command or changing our work plane. Okay? Let's do it. Let's jump in. This could be a fun little challenge. I'm going to start with the selection of this cube and let's turn our turn on our snapping engine and let's look at what happens when we do uh, let's do edge center. So you can have more than one snap, snap feature on at a time, okay? You can snap to everything or just one thing. It's up to you to figure out what that is, right? I'm going to choose to do a little vertex snapping, and I also want to snap to edge centers. I like that, okay? Let's get rid of this form and start placing our tool handles. Check it out. I'm working, uh, I don't have an action center enabled right now, and so I, can, I get to place my tool handles wherever I want inside of our scene, but when I start hovering over the center of an edge, what pops in? Do you get, can you guys see that on the, on the projector? Yeah, now I can snap my tool handle there. Ha ha ha, awesome. And this is what's cool. My tool handle is in the center of the cube, right? The center of the window. And now I need to move it pen tablet's messing me up here. Now I need to move it left or right. Okay. However, it's beginning to snap as well. If I place my cursor over to what I think is another snap point, like the center of that edge, see how it just snaps? Bloop. Awesome. Let's do the exact same thing for this one here, for the center of the vertical edge. And let's make sure that it's snapping there. See the little purple dot underneath my cursor? That's the snap engine. Oops, because I zoomed in, it went crazy. There it is. And now I know beyond any reasonable doubt that that square, the window cutter geometry, is in the dead center of the, of the outside walls. I didn't have to align the work plane. I didn't have to use center selected. The snap engine allowed me to prototype this pretty quickly and get it all into play. If I wasn't teaching and showing, these, showing you guys how these tools work, it's like three seconds. It's pretty fast. Okay. All right, let's turn off my snap engine by hitting the X key on the keyboard and continue working because uh, I have some, some additional things in here that I need to do. Now, if you remember from uh, GCOM 402 and our conversation about Booleans, you'll probably remember that really for this entire Boolean system to work, we need to have the cutter geometry, so in our case the windows, pass through the walls that we want that cutter geometry to influence, okay? 
They have to go all the way through, okay? All the way through. Now for these, I don't want to have my windows show up on this side because that's going to be another part of the model. This one over here, I've made it really long and I've stretched it out through both walls so that one cube is really cutting two sides of my, of my bedroom. All right, all right. Let's grab all my windows and I'm going to cut and paste them into my windows mesh. There we go. All right, now for the Boolean system to work, and before I go any further, let me just get rid of all my middle lines. I don't need them anymore. Now for my Boolean system to work, uh, we need to have the mesh item, because this happens at the item level, the mesh item that contains all of my cutter geometry visible but unselected. And in the Moto world, this is called in the background, right? We, if we see the black wireframes for the background geometry, we know we've done it right. I'm also going to explore the contents of my item list real fast. Yep, here's the bedroom. It's selected in the foreground. This, is ha this one has all the cutting geometry on it. It's unselected but visible in the background of my scene. Now, where are we going? Where do we find all the Boolean tools inside of Moto? Yeah, the geometry pull-down menu found at the top of the screen. Geometry, and then way down here at the bottom. Now we have three. We have some choices in here which are pretty interesting. I would recommend that you spend your time with solid drill. There's some differences between these three, but solid drill gives you the most control over the next step. Okay? I like solid drill. You'll get a little pop over. And it's going to ask you to choose the type of operation, the type of solid drill Boolean operation you want to work with. Look at the driver mesh. It's anything that's in the background and anything that's in the background. Okay? So make sure that you're specific and only have the cutting geometry that you want to cut the holes visible in the background of your scene. So I like to have stencil or slice. These are my two favorites. Let's just do slice. Because like I said, this just gives me control over what that next step is. The moment we hit OK, boom. You can see that our mission is complete, and our little bedroom here is starting to take shape. Let's turn off the mesh item that's responsible for cutting our shapes. Yeah, rock and roll, and things are starting to look pretty good. Okay. Now, this needs to be a compliant surface type. It needs to be all quad polygons, OK? A lot of folks, they get a little confused as to what in the world you know, you know, uh, this thing is right there, those little side corners. See one there, see one over there. Does anyone know what that is? Want to take a guess? Yeah. You got it. That's the program trying to make sense of this n-gon, right? It has to create some edge to connect these two n-gon islands to each other, right? So we don't want them, though. They're generally kind of annoying. And we don't want our geometry flowing into the corners like that. I need to start slicing this mesh to get it into a compliant, uh, into a compliant surface type quad polygons, right? How are we going to do this? What should the result look like? Sometimes if you start to uh, you know, envision the goal, the solution and which tools to use kind of pops, pops in. Ideas, Mike? Yeah, it should look as if we loop sliced it, right? So we should probably start to see some lines go like right to here, right? And I want to botch this a little bit, but I think you'll probably get the idea, right? So we should probably should connect all these surfaces like that. And then same going vertically. Okay. In here. So on and so forth, going all the way around the mesh. Okay. Yeah, that's the result. That's kind of the target here for what we're trying to capture. How can we do this quickly? I really can't use loop slice because we don't have any loops to slice, right? Edge slice, not going to work too well, especially going around the corners of our mesh. So what does that leave us with? Good old slice. I love slice. Slice is one of my favorite slicing tools. There's some power within the slice tool that makes it kind of more than meets the eyes. Let me show you what I'm talking about. It's really kind of neat. 
a lot of folks choose not to work with the general slice tool because on the surface it seems very uncontrollable, right? It's just kind of a laser beam that's going through our mesh that just slices everything in its path. Uh, however, if we, uh, if we modify a couple different things, we can actually bend the slice tool to do our bidding. Let's check it out. As, I, as you are well aware, the moto mantra of working with tools or just kind of in general are selections, right? Whatever is selected is going to be edited. Okay? If nothing is selected, everything is going to be edited. I really only want to work with these polygons in here. Okay? Initially, I'll grab that one too. Okay? So I want to do all the horizontal slices first, because I can do actually slice this entire mesh in one mighty fell swoop. Okay, let's look at it from an orthographic view real fast, and to help you all see it, I'm going to turn on the verts. Okay, now as you're well aware, the slice tool is found under your mesh edit category of tools, and it's right there. Me lovey the slice tool. This is one of my favorites. Okay, however. Uh, if we just left click and drag, you can quickly see the problem with the slice tool. It's a laser, right? Wherever we drag inside of the OpenGL viewport, it's going to slice our mesh. That purple line represents the slice. If I was to drop the tool and drop the selection, bloop, bloop, you can see what I've done here, right? Just a, that thing right there, okay? This new edge was, was me using the slice tool. But I certainly don't want it to be at an angle like that. And I want to be able to very quickly go back in time. There we go. I want to be able to very, very quickly slice this in accurately. Well, if we use our good old snapping tools and maybe some vertex snapping, we can do this pretty quickly. Check this out. Let's turn on our snapping engine once more. This time, I'm just going to do vertex snapping. So we'll turn off edge center. And now, with the vertex snapping enabled, the slice tool becomes much, much more powerful. Let's check it out. It's going to naturally start on a vert, and I can slice this way. Okay, I can go vert to vert, or since the slice tool is really a laser, I can extend it. It's the two crosses that represent the beginning and the end of our slice laser, if you will, go outside the mesh. It's going to slice everything in its path. Okay. I like working with the slice tool in those orthographic views of our 3D scene. Because in a perspective view, it kind of, the slice tool gets conceptual pretty quickly. Most, you know, most people have a hard time kind of figuring out you know, the angle of that plane. Some people don't have a hard time with it. I find it really frustrating myself. So I like working with the slice tool in the orthographic views. But use, use the slice tool however it makes the most sense to you. Okay. Yeah, no, it's a laser. I had all four sides of my cube selected, right? So it sliced through all of them, which I like. Or I just leave them unselected, and now it's going to slice whatever comes into its path. Let's do it again. All right, let's do it again. Let's run the slice. I got my vertex snapping going. Just slice this way. Boop. OK, which is pretty great. If I extend my purple line outside my mesh, now I've just sliced the entire thing. That's pretty neat. Makes this whole process go a whole lot faster. I want to hit the undo key real fast because I want to show you something that I think is really neat. This is an, an, an enhancement to the slice tool. Okay. I'm going to run the slice tool. I'm still going to use my vertex snapping that I did, that I did last time. But there's a new one down here, and this is relatively new. I think this popped in in version 9. We're in version 10 at the moment, and it's called Infinite. Infinite's pretty neat. However, you have to have a good understanding of how the slice tool works to really understand the awesomeness of this infinite section, or this infinite uh, option, excuse me. With infinite turned off, wherever that purple line is, is your laser, right? And it's only going to slice inside that purple line. Let me zoom out so you can see that real fast. Okay, so if I draw a line right here, this is the beginning of my purple line, right? There's the beginning, there's the end. Okay, if you take a step back and look at what it's doing, it's only slicing inside that plane. If I drop the tool, that's a bad slice because we certainly don't want to have a vert just hanging out in the middle of a polygon like that, right? That's no bueno. 
So that's how the, the general, the default slice tool works. If we pair it with infinite, though, check this action out. I just love this. Let's turn infinite on, okay? And now I could just do a small little line like that, and look what it's doing. Maybe difficult to see. Let me just drop my selection, and I'll do it one more time. With infinite on, I can draw a line, but then it's going to infinitely expand my slice plane along that angle, okay? Even though my action, my tool handles for the slice tool are, you know, right there and right there, it's continuing to slice this way and that way infinitely. This is fantastic because now I can relatively stay in the area of interest and slice outside of it. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Now I can use my vertex snapping in the slice tool and then to snap between those two points or shoot, just draw a line between there and there. And as long as it's straight, it's going to infinitely slice along that plane. Okay? It allows me to repeat that. I'm going to hold down the shift key, draw that way. And then I can draw that way, that way, that way, that way, and I'm done. Okay? The infinite option allows us to slice pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. Because it doesn't force us to have to go outside the model. We can stay inside the model and know that it's going to slice past the tool handles. Does that make sense? It's a great, great workflow modifier. I love infinite slicing. It's pretty great. I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to infinite slicing because now I can just go yoink. Now for here, in this particular situation, we already have an existing edge. So I want to be real careful and only select the polygons that I want to slice. I've noticed that we can get some duplicate geometry pretty quickly in this particular situation. Uh, so let's just be, be careful. Go hold on the shift key and then I'm done. Okay. All right. Now everything's sliced up, ready to rock and roll. At this point, I'm going to get rid of some of these angles in here. These aren't, aren't needed anymore. Like that. Awesome sauce. I love it. That's good stuff. That's really good stuff because I was able to, to flush this out pretty quickly. So get that one in there. These are all my windows. I'm ready to rock and roll. So what's next for creating these windows, you think? Probably should delete them because we want some openings, right? That makes sense. Let's delete them for a second. How are we going to create the inside of our building quickly? You could bevel the ceiling down. I like that, right? That's a good option. What are some other options in here? Other options. Now, how are we going to create the thickness of the windows on the inside? Uh, you would select the vert of the ones that are the polygons and then uh, fill in with the polygon fill. That's an interesting idea, for sure. Let me show you an alternative to that that may give you the result a little bit quicker. Okay? I'm actually going to delete the tops and the bottom. So, what would be the roof? and the floor. Okay, don't worry. They're not going to be gone for very long. Delete. And I'm left with what ultimately is like a 2D shell, if you will, of our, op of our object. Okay, 2D shell. Check this out. I'm going to create the walls of my room using the Thicken tool. Okay, the Thicken tool is really a mashup of a couple different tools and some operations that we've been doing for a long, long time. Okay, Check it out. I'm going to grab my mesh. And you can find Thicken in a couple different places, but it's an all-star. Uh, so they've placed it inside of the, uh, the basic tool collection of tools. And uh, oops, my interface is cutting it off. There it is, Thicken, right there. So let's turn it on. And we'll just left-click in the viewport. You'll get some tool handles. Don't mess with the red one. That's with the blue one. I want to go this way. And there it is. Aha. Awesome. And I've created the thickness of my walls pretty quickly. Now, at times, if you look very carefully at this, let's look at my mesh from the top. Yeah, that's not so hot, right? 
because we got a great straight line, then it goes at an angle. We don't want it to be at an angle. We want it to be kind of straight like that. That's a product of the Thicken operation, but don't worry, we can fix it. There's a great option for us in Thicken, excuse me, that will fix some of these options, and it's right here. It's called Sharp. And that does a really great job of making sure that the walls are all the same, the same thickness. And there's no longer that kind of scooping that we see going into the corners. Now, ha ha! Rock and roll. Awesome. Because now we've done a simple slice for all of our windows. The thickened tool has allowed us to kind of grow our walls inward, and it's done a tremendous amount of the work for us automatically. Okay? Now we still have a couple things in here that we need to get to very quickly, right? We still need to put a roof, a ceiling, and a floor on the interior of the wall, right? Ceiling and floor on the interior. Let's do that real quick. It's not as hard as one might think. How would you do it? Let's, let's work on the floor. How are we going to get a floor? Because we have to have some geometry down there. How are you going to do it? Yeah. So select all the edges. Hit the P key, which is going to fill that with a polygon. Yeah, that's one way of doing it, for sure. For sure, that's not a bad way. Absolutely. That, gets, that gives us pretty quickly the result that we're after. In the game art pipeline, that's not a bad thing, OK? Because it just creates one polygon. Hit the P key. Oop. It actually did it, but it's flipped the wrong way. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to flip it with the F key, OK? Single polygon down there. Yeah, that works. It's a great way of working. Okay. If you're old school like I am and you believe in compliant meshes, uh, I really, really want this is my OCD 3D modeling brain kind of going out of control right now. Okay. I really, really, really want to have edges going this way. I want to connect the dots. I want to preserve all of my loops. Okay. These loops are important for me. So I know from my experience that I'm going, to get, I'm going to get a tremendous amount of edit flexibility in the future if I have all of those there. So ideally, I would love to fill that area, but get all my loops too. Okay. How can I do that? I already have a basic piece of geometry. Is there a way that I could get those loops like I had in the diagram just a second ago? Samantha's shaking her, nod her head, yeah. How can we do it? Edge slice is a good option, right? It's a great option. Edge slice is, our, is a power tool. Allows us to very quickly connect the dots. Just get it in there really fast. This works pretty well. If you have multi-slice turned on, Multi-slice, if this is turned on, watch what happens when I go the other direction. Hold down the shift key, and now it'll slice through all of them at the same time, which is kind of nice. Hold down shift, do it again. Okay, me likey, that's a good way of doing it, right? Rock and roll, I love it. Okay, that works, that's fine, it really is. That's a fine way of doing it. Let me show you another alternative, because there's a bazillion different ways to skin this cat. I'm going to go back a couple steps here to the stage where I had the opening of my mesh selected. What's another way that we could do this? It's going to kind of fill in the, this entire grid for us automatically. What tool, yeah, Melissa? And bridge, the bridge tool. Yeah, the bridge tool is a pretty neat tool, right? This is what Melissa was talking about. You can grab edges that are across from each other like this, okay? And then run the bridge tool, which is found in a couple different places. But since it's so great, it's found right there inside of our interface, okay? In the basic tool area. Let's run bridge. Bloop. Now they're flipped, but that's okay. So they're right down there. That works. Bridging is just fine. It really is. But check this out. This is actually kind of cool. There's, an, there's a power feature in bridge that everyone should be aware of. I want to bridge. I want to basically do this entire step in one click. Okay. I want to run bridge. Okay. But I want to make sure. 
some properties are enabled here. And specifically, auto connection and continuous bridges. Okay, check this out. This is neat. With it off, this is what's going to happen. Not a darn thing, right? With it on, and then we click, well, I might have to go back. I clicked once already. Let's try it again. Bridge. Boop. Come on. Ugh. I got to deselect these. I always forget that. Here we go. Now when I run bridge, it's not grabbing the other ones. I wonder if it's because of these bottom polygons down here. Yeah. So we're close. We're close. It should have sliced it that way for me. And it may be getting messed up here because all of these guys here at the bottom. Let's just delete them and see what it does. Actually, I think you, you should have. Hmm. Ah, it's going to make a liar out of me today. So I'll just bridge it manually. There it goes. Now it worked. There it is. Okay. So auto connection is going to do that way. And then continuous bridge is needed for the auto connection to work. Okay. Actually, it works in this particular situation. It works with it off. It's a great way of filling in the, in, in the grid. Okay. We don't have to go back and slice them. Really handy in some extreme situations when there's a lot of, a lot of edge loops running perpendicular to the flow of the polygons. Pretty neat, huh? Some, some modifiers to our modeling workflow that allows us to get to the end result pretty quickly. Okay, and there it is. There's my mesh. I'm a happy camper. I do the exact same thing for the top, by the way. I delete that loop of polygons at the top, select the edges, run bridge. Boop. That's my snapping engine that's... Come on now. Bridge, yoink, there it is. And I'm on my way. Done. In a couple seconds, things are, things are exactly the way they want to be. Now, the detail in here is pretty interesting as well. And let me show you some of the power of, uh, of, of, of the snapping engine when, when fusing detail into these areas. Okay, Because we can work quickly. It's not about working hard. It's about working smart. right? Let me show you some ideas here. I'm going to go into my my rough model, because I have some problems on my rough one here that I need to kind of resolve pretty quickly, OK? I got some issues in here that I need to just kind of, mm, it's driving me crazy. It's driving me absolutely batty, OK? And let's initially begin with, uh, how are we going to do this? Let's do, let's do this, these two in here. Hide everything else, and let's look at what I have. Now, when I was prototyping this earlier, when I did my rough model, man, I just didn't do a very good job here. I did kind of a horrible job. And if you look at this from the front, there's a gigantic gap in there. Oh, we don't play that, right? We don't do gaps. We don't want gaps. That's a bad, bad, bad place to begin, right? I want them to be perfectly right on top of each other, which allows me to get to the next stage, which you'll see here in a minute, OK? Is there a way I can get the top of the vertical the top of the vertical, uh, or excuse me, the bottom, the bottom polygon of our vertical post at the exact same location of the top of our horizontal post. How am I going to do that? Snap it. Absolutely. Our snap engine is going to come in here. Okay. Let me just grab that bottom polygon, look at my object from the front. I'll turn on my snapping engine and explore its options. So right now, I'm doing some vertex snapping, which is exactly what I want. If I fire off the Move tool, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my, my cursor on the handle itself. But then, check it out. See how my cursor has kind of gone purpley? Let's see if I can zoom in. See the little purple crosshair there? That's the snap engine. Oops. And now it's wigging out because that was all zoomed in. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my cursor, that purple crosshair, on the object that I want to snap to, which is that vert. And boink, now it's perfectly in there. And I know beyond any reasonable doubt that those two verts are sharing the exact same location, that they're perfectly right on top of each other in a heartbeat. Okay? 
I don't have to think about it. It's incredibly organic. And it makes aligning all of these different polygonal features quick and easy. Okay. Ah, I'm, I'm in love with that, right? Because now what I'm able to do, now I don't want to have an actuality. Oh, look at this. Oh, bad pat, bad pat. Look at that. That front face is a different angle, a different size. Oh, however, luckily for us, our vertex snapping system is going to allow us drink, to model with accuracy and fix some, some of those errors. Really quite good. Now, at the end of the day, I don't actually want the bottom of that piece and the top polygon of that piece to be sharing the exact same space. That's going to present some problems with us. And it's not going to create a compelling sense of realism. So here's a great trick, something that we can and should do, especially on something like a beam. Okay? Because a wooden beam is always going to have some small rounded edges to it. Wooden beams are very rarely perfectly perpendicular, or the faces of a wooden beam are perfectly perpendicular. So we should try to include that idea in all the models that we generate, right? Let's do it on this bottom one. I've initially created a polygonal selection. And I'm going to convert my polygonal selection into an edge selection by holding down the Option key on my keyboard, which is going to convert whoop, like that, which is kind of nice. And now, believe it or not, I'm just going to run an edge bevel. The edge shape is going to be round. The round level is going to be oops, 0. Okay, And then create this really cool little chamfer effect kind of creating the illusion that this is an individual board. Okay? I wouldn't go much further past that edge, uh, that an edge level of zero for like big beams, okay? especially in a real-time environment. Okay? Uh, these, uh, these little chamfers in there go a long, long way. It's going to catch the light, so you get a little specular hit, and it's going to feel a little bit more real. Okay? I like that. All right. All right, let's look at some other problems that I have intentionally crafted in this area. Now let's look at these two in here. Now geometrically we have some issues in here that we've got to resolve. Okay. Does anyone has anyone done some construction work before? Anyone built something here or there, or at least kind of have a little bit of exposure to, to how some houses and some walls are put together? When you become a 3D modeler, in every sense, you kind of become a little expert on a couple different things. And one of the things that I've learned from my exposure in the 3D modeling world are how real buildings are put together. Now, I'm not a carpenter. I'm not a construction worker. I couldn't actually build a building, although I think I'd probably do an OK job, right? But what I do understand is the kind of the role of gravity in all this, OK? Imagine that these are actual beams, OK? What would, at the moment, at the moment, what would be holding up these beams? Oops. Look at my model for a second. How is that beam connected to that post? In your imagination, how is it connected? Yeah, so you'd probably have to have some sort of L bracket down here, right, to support the weight. Or you'd have to have, you know, some screws in here somehow connecting you know this beam to to this post okay there's gonna be some sort of fastener i guess you could say is that good construction no absolutely not because you put all of the weight of the entire building or the entire structure on a screw or a bolt or something which you don't want to do right what would probably be the best way to do this You need to make some changes. Okay? Really, the best way to do this would be to have this beam be sitting on top of this one. Right? So when gravity starts to come into effect here, it's going to be, you know, this beam is going to be sitting on top of this part down over here. Okay? So I need to make some changes here. I need to have this beam cut across the mesh like that. Okay? I did it wrong when I modeled this. Okay, so I need to go in and quickly change this to create the sense of weight, the appropriate sense of weight for this object. Now, this is pretty easy to do, especially with all of our snapping tools in tow here, right? This is the power of the snap engine, okay? And going back to that slicing stuff, 
I still got my snapping tools enabled. I'm doing some vertex snapping, and I'm just going to run good old slice. And since I'm using infinite slice here, I just have to do a little bit, and I've sliced that beam in a heartbeat, right? OK, awesome. Now I just get rid of that entire loop. Bye bye Unhide it. Let's get this back in action here. And now I can make some connections. OK, now luckily for us, I have all this stuff in, in play already. And I'm simply just going to do a, a bridge. Bloop. And then I don't need these two pieces anymore, so let's delete them. So there we go. That's what we want to have, OK? Because we have a beam going this way. OK? And now this post is sitting on top of that beam, OK? And in every sense, this, this post here is resting on top of this beam with the gravity going down. Right? It's good modeling. It's good modeling. Okay? And it continues to establish a structure geometrically that will facilitate a really, really easy modeling, uh, or excuse me, UV in stage, right? It's these little things in your model that actually make it photorealistic, that produces a sense of weight, that creates the illusion of gravity. Okay? That gravity is part of your thought process, or it should be part of your thought process. Okay. All right. If you look at some of my other beams in here, I got the exact same problem on this one, right? Look at this transition. Yowzas. That's no bueno here. I got some. I got some big time issues. So how can I resolve this, right? Loop slice isn't going to do what I want it to do. That's out of the question here. How can I make this work? How can I edit that angled beam uh, to, get, to get it to, to work like I did on the, on the previous beam? Thoughts, questions, ideas? Huh? Yeah, the slice tool paired with some vertex snapping and some simple selections can get us what we want pretty quickly, right? So I need to chop up this guy. Let's look at it from the front. I'll run the slice tool, mesh edit, slice. I can see that my snapping engine's still on. And check it out. I don't even have to drag on the mesh. And with that infinite option on, it's going to do all the heavy lifting for me. OK? Mission accomplished. OK? Excellent. Now, what's also neat about this is that it is, uh, um, let's just hide it. Loop, delete, OK? Unhide, let's get these two things, or these three things, excuse me, working in hom harmony with each other. Okay? Now, this next bit can get a little confusing, right? Because now I need to start moving this that way. Luckily for me, I don't have to care about it, right? I can get sloppy. I can just extend it way past. I don't have to be precise. I don't even care if the angle is the same, right? Let's make it not the same. Now it's not the same. How am I going to slice this beam to match that angle there? That angle. Which way are you going to slice across? Where are you going to begin and end your slice operation? So right here? Yes, absolutely. Because these two verts, in every sense, create the angle for us, right? These are our two slice indicators, our slice markers, if you will. Okay. So once again, my snapping engine's on. I'll run slice. This time, yeah, infinite slice is going to do the job. There it is right there. Perfect. Oops, I didn't. I'm a dork. Let's grab the entire mesh pad. Boink. Hold down the shift key. Boink. And I'm done. OK, now all of this in here is slop. We don't need that. Bye bye And I'm on my way. Looks like, however, oh, I didn't, uh, yeah, looks like just triple checking, make sure we don't have any hidden polygons in there. Oops. OK, now is this in here needed? 
Actually, I didn't need to slice it. That was just habit. Not needed, right? Doesn't change the shape. It's not needed. OK. Looking pretty good, huh? Pretty neat. And I need to do the same thing over there as well. Let's, uh, let's convert over to edges. We'll do a very simple edge bevel. Yeah, there we go. Start to look pretty good. Now, that edge bevel kind of screwed me to a certain degree, right? Especially on that top one. Let's figure out why it screwed me. I have a hunch. These, these boards aren't the same thickness. And I've also noticed that when doing edge bevels on polygonal shapes that have openings like this one does, it kind of doesn't work the way you want it to. It'll start to shrink the shape, so I'm going to close it up. There we go. Unhide everything. Convert the edge selection. There we go. Well, yes, it would. It absolutely would. And, and I still have some work in here that I need to do. The, the width of some of these boards were inaccurate, which has given us some problems. Okay. However, you know, we can certainly go in. And we're not ever really going to see that one down there, that polygon. So you can delete it, right? All I really care about is the chamfered edge in here. Yeah, rock and roll. And without those, without those, uh, um, yeah, that's looking pretty good. Much better, right? See how the light's just catching that edge right there? It makes it feel like a wooden beam as opposed to just a rectangle. Okay? Really, really simple, easy, easy peasy little modeling enhancements that you can do to make your mesh just really sing and to make it really quite cool. Okay? Very easy. Use the slicing tools. Use the snapping engine, right? It's amazing how fast you can edit your mesh when you start pairing the awesomeness of slice and the snapping engine into your workflow. Okay? I can't model anymore without the snapping engine in Moto. I can't model anymore without the slice tools. They're just that good. They're just that good. All right, questions, comments? All right, let's revisit what we're expected to build yeah. uh, for, our, for our assignment. Logged me out. All right. So this week, we are building a blacksmith shop. Okay. As I mentioned at the beginning of the class today, you can do whatever type of blacksmith shop that you'd like. Okay. Pick a style and then commit to it and run with it. We're going to be living with this project for the next three weeks. We, you know, part one is the model. Part two, UVs and textures. And our process of creating UVs and textures, well, yeah, just the process of creating UV and textures is going to shift next week. Okay? It's going to change in a big way because how we model a prop, like a crate or a wine barrel or a sword, is wholesale different than how we do the textures for our building. Okay? And we'll look at those differences in detail next week. Next week is definitely not a day you're going to want to miss. Okay? Uh, there's going to be a lot of new stuff thrown at you next week. I'll be live streaming again because it is pretty intense. Okay? Intense is the wrong word. It's just new. We're going to be looking at things new, uh, looking at things differently with a new, with a new pipeline. Um, also, start throwing in some details like this. right? It's things like, like anvils and hammers and saws or a little, a little stack of you know, wooden logs or a shield lean, uh, you know, leaning up against the wall that really starts to make this blacksmith shop feel human, right? We always want to suggest and remind to our audience that these wonderful environments have been touched somehow by humanity, that we've left an impression on that environment. You know, maybe the blacksmith is not there. He's gone to lunch, okay? But maybe all of his tools are still left out, right? Those small little details go a long, long way. If you take a look at some of the assignments that we've done already in this class, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, you already have some stuff that you can put in your blacksmith shop, right? Like a wine barrel, maybe a crate, I don't know, a sword or a shield or two. Things that we've already done in this class can and should be used in this project. Okay? Start detailing it out. 
It's amazing how quickly these, these environments come to life when we start putting these little human details in there. Okay? Now's a good time to start prototyping that and making the system work together harmoniously. Okay? Um, I want you to focus exclusively on the model this week. Don't start UV mapping stuff yet. Okay? We're going to save that for next week because the process of UV mapping in our thought process is going to change a little bit. Okay? I don't want you to waste your time. So fun uh, exclusively on the, on the geometry. The geometry for your blacksmith shop is due next week. So we just to get to turn on the headphones and start modeling, man. This is the fun part creating these wonderful worlds that our, that our blacksmiths get to inhabit. Now, I'm an old school 3D modeler, and I'm going to force my hand on you. Of course, we still have to finish the sci-fi panel. Many of you guys got very, very far on this lab assignment during our lab time together in class. Some of you are near completion. So wrap that one up pretty quickly and put that to bed, OK? Because uh, you have one other thing that I want you to do during your lab time today, and it's reference. <laughs> is to do a little research, okay? Is to gather some images that you found online that act as a starting point, a moment of inspiration for your blacksmith shop project, okay? So I'm gonna force my hand on it. This is a great book item, you have to do it. If you click on the Dropbox, you get some simple little instructions. And here it is 10 reference images. I'm sorry, I'm logged in as me. Uh, 10 reference images, okay? Yeah, 10. You're probably going to want to get more than this, just to give you ideas and to start kind of understanding what this thing looks like. Now, there's not an expectation by me that you build the objects that you create or that you collect in your reference, OK? It's just a starting point. I hope that you make changes. I hope that you add stuff on, mash things together, and make it unique, and make it your own, OK? So it's a starting point, but everyone has to define their starting point, OK? We all think we know what a blacksmith ship looks like. But if we don't have any reference images at our disposal, what we model is never going to look like it should. Okay. Questions? Everyone understand the expectations for this week? It's kind of a fun modeling week, okay? I love weeks like this where we just kind of jump in and make something. Not too technical or crazy difficult as like UV mapping and sometimes working with Photoshop. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? Everyone understanding? All right, good luck. I'll see you guys next week.